This is Duke University. Noon. I'm David Levy. I'm Dean of the Duke Law School. Welcome to Duke Law School. Uh, it is our privilege to host this celebration of the publication of a memoir and of a partnership of John and Patricia Adams. And that partnership was on behalf of the environment, but it was also on behalf of themselves. They met here at Duke, uh, where Patricia was uh, an undergraduate and, and John a student at this law school. Their, their book is entitled A Force for Nature, and this has engendered a good deal of confusion. Um, you'll see that, um, or maybe some of you saw that on our website this morning, uh, they were described as a force of nature, <laughs> and it's an understandable uh, confusion. We may have to reconvene the Council of Nicaea to sort it all out. Um, John graduated in 1962 from, from Duke Law School, and a scant Eight years later, he began what became the NRDC and where he served as the executive director from 1970 until 2006. This is an organization that has had a very profound influence on environmental law in this country, environmental law and policy. It has now uh, well over 1.3 million members. And there are two things about uh, this career path that seem notable to me. First of all, while it is certainly extraordinary, it's not entirely unique because other Duke Law graduates have also had this kind of creative commitment to the environment. Douglas Wheeler at the Sierra Club, Derwood Zelke at the Center for International Environmental Law, Steve Rohde as the founding president of Oce Oceana, Tim Profeta at the Nicholas Institute, and uh, may I add to the list Richard Nixon, the, um, the <laughs> president who signed into law the statutes that have given us the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, and the Environmental Protection Agency. It's also notable that, um, that John was so creative at such an early point in his career, and I think for the law students that are here, it's noteworthy to, to think that, that the education that is provided at the law school is, is, is truly a launching pad, and that in a very short period of time, you're in a position of doing something um, that, is, that can be transformative. From John Adams to our environmental law clinic, there is a, a direct line. And that line, um, the partnership of these two uh, that we're so honored to have here today is uh, symbolized in the partnership of the two schools, the Nicholas School and the Law School, to produce this clinic where half Nicholas students and half law students study and work every year. And we see that partnership as well in Jim Salzman, who's going to be doing our interviewing here today. He is a, a joint appointment at, at both schools. He's the Samuel F. Mordecai Professor of Law and the Nicholas Institute Professor of Environmental Policy. He's a wonderful scholar, a superb teacher. He wins awards virtually every year uh, because of both. And it is my particular pleasure to turn over the podium to Bill Shemides, who is the Dean of the Nicholas School and Nicholas Professor of the Environment. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, and he was Chief Scientist of the Environmental Defense Fund. He's a dynamic leader here on campus. He's my friend. Bill. <clears throat> that applause was for David, right? So, um, well, thank you so much. It's great to be here. Um, I first met John and Patricia when I came to Duke as the Dean of the Nicholas School some three years ago, but I certainly knew of the Adams by reputation. I spent three years as the Chief Scientist in Environmental Defense Fund, and all of those three years felt like we were always trying to catch up to NRDC. <laughs> um, John and Patricia have been um, the wise folks of the Nicholas School Board. They have. Um, advised and directed me, have provided a lot of sage advice. In fact, John just did a few minutes ago and straightened me out about something, which I really appreciate. Um, what I was really um, taken by the book is the first chapter. You see, um, one of the things that excites me so much about Duke 
and, and interacting with the students who are interested in the environment is I'm so amazed at their, their energy, their idealism, and their commitment. And I realized as I read the book that the model for those folks are these two people right over here who at, some, at a point in their times were somewhat younger than they are now. Uh, no less idealistic, but um, had the nerve to try something that was sure to fail and were incredibly successful and made history and changed the world. Um, lots of times we think about the beginning of the environmental movement perhaps being, the modern environmental movement perhaps being with Rachel Carson's book, The Silent Spring. In reading this book, it occurred to me that in another sense, the modern environmental movement began with John and Patricia Adams and the beginning of NRDC, where they established the fact that people without standing, and I, that is a legal term, so I, even though I'm not a lawyer, perhaps I can use it, that people typically without standing do have standing when it comes to the environment. And those folks can go to, um, for example, courts and force people to do the right thing as it relates to the environment. And while we often think of the Environmental Protection Agency as being the protectors of the environment, it becomes quite clear that organizations like NRDC are perhaps even fulfilling that duty even better than EPA and certainly better than many corporations. Although I don't want to make a generalization about corporations. Anyway, it is such a pleasure to uh, see them here today. Uh, <coughs> I highly recommend this book. It is um, fascinating and exciting and eye-opening. And uh, thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. <coughs> all right. Uh, thanks, David and Bill, and thanks you all for being here. So the book that we're talking about is here, Force for Nature. There actually is a book table uh, outside, along with forms, if you want to, if you want to order the book. Um, so I thought we'd chat for about 30, 40 minutes and then open up to, um, to questions. So let me start uh, sort of somewhere at the beginning. So John, you grew up in upstate New York. You went to college at Michigan State. Uh, and then you went to Duke Law. And sort of two questions, why law school and why Duke? Uh, well, law school, because I, I thought this would, would be an opportunity to really, uh, you know, do some things I thought I could do. And I thought law school would be the easiest way to get where I thought I wanted to get to. The path has been a little tricky, but law school made a lot of sense. And I met Dean Laddie. He came to Michigan State. And uh, I was invited to uh, a little affair. And there were five or six of us who met with him. and. And he uh, said to me, if you come to Duke, we'll get you out. <laughs> and I said, that makes a lot of sense to me, <laughs> being quite nervous about my ability to get out of law school at that point. But it was really, uh, so I had a choice of some really good law schools. But I said, you know, I really feel like I liked him a lot. I thought he was a really nice man and a sensible man. And so that's why I came here. Mm -hmm. And for both of you, so what was college like and what was law school like for those interested in the environment in, in the 60s? It didn't exist. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I think what for Patricia and I, Patricia's a Smoky Mountain lady and uh, comes from seven or eight generations up on the mountains there. And uh, so I, I spent a lot of time hiking and walking and uh, all of my free time was uh, spent out of doors and enjoying uh, the North Carolina countryside. And Patricia and I spent time up at her home, up in uh, the Smokies, uh, past Asheville. And As we, we were talking about this last night a little bit, the <clears throat> term environmental or environmentalism really hardly existed in the 60s. It, was, it came to, to have meaning more in the 70s. But both John and I, he grew up in upstate New York, as he said, and I grew up in Asheville, but my family had property in the Nantahala National Forest. So uh, throughout my childhood, we camped and hiked and stayed in the mountains. And even though we didn't put a name to it, my, my father's mantra was, can't you hear the wild? It's calling you from the Robert Service Point. And you know, nature had a kind of spiritual quality uh, growing up, so that even though it wasn't an official term, environmentalism, I think there was a sense in both of us that nature, in the broadest sense of the word, was really something that we cared a great deal about. So, so NRDC sort of came into being in 1969. It was, it was incorporated in 1970. It was a result of you joining forces with some real, recent Yale, Yale Law School grads. So on the one hand, the environmental space, if you want to call it that, you had the traditional groups like the Sierra Club, the Audubon Society, 
On the other, you had groups like the NAACP um, a Legal Defense Fund, you had anti-war groups, you had women's rights groups. What was the model? What sort of vision did you have when this came together, and, and, and why did you come together? Well, there were several uh, fights that were taking place at that uh, time, and uh, one of them was the min uh, Mineral King in California, and the other was Storm King. Uh, and uh, so the, the Western, the Sierra Club, was fighting Mineral King with advertising and uh, demonstrations and uh, sort of the usual way that the Sierra Club acted at that point. And uh, the Storm King case was fought in court by a group of lawyers uh, and hun became hundreds and then thousands of people who opposed the development of a pump storage plant on Storm King Mountain, a, fa a very famous mountain that was painted by the Hudson River uh, painters, and you know, see it in every museum, and it's uh, just a beautiful mountain, and they were going to carve the face off the front, build a lake on top, uh, and put a penstock in, and uh, pour the water out for, uh, for uh, energy when needed. Uh, and that required them to suck a lot of water out of the Hudson River, and it turned out that the, where the Storm King is, the fish and larvae go by where the penstock would be many times. And they would felt that it would uh, kill and uh, damage uh, maybe as much as uh, 60 or 70 percent of the fish and larvae that went by the uh, penstock in the river. And that was, that's how we ultimately ended the uh, fight. Mm -hmm. But we, we were invited in uh, by the lawyers who were working on that. Stephen Duggan, a senior partner in Simpson, Thatcher, and Bartlett. And several of his partners were involved, Cy Vance and uh, uh, you know, a number of other really uh, the top people in New York. And I was at the US Attorney's Office. And they knew that Patricia and I uh, had this uh, life outside of the US Attorney's Office in the country. And, uh, and uh, people just thought I was a, obviously somebody they should talk to. So they did. And uh, we were thinking about what what we were going to do next. I had worked on Wall Street, and I felt I would never return there. Uh, and I had been four and a half years at the US Attorney's <laughs> Office. I loved it. We looked at buying a farm, and uh, both of us said, no, we're not ready for cows <laughs> and, uh, and uh, farm life. And along came this opportunity. And uh, Stephen Duggan, the senior partner at Simpson Thatcher, uh, Th uh, said to me, I think that we can create something like the NAACP Legal Defense Fund for the Environment, or the Civil Liberties Union. And all of the people who surrounded us were people who had been cause-oriented. They had been involved in the Civil Liberties Union. They were Quakers. They were people who were working to preserve Central Park. Uh, they were uh, Jim Marshall, whose brother Bob Marshall was the founder of the Wilderness Society and so several of the great forests of America are named after Bob Marshall for his, his pioneering work with the Forest Service. And there they made this offer, and it sounded like a great thing. And I went to Patricia, and, and I don't know why she said yes, but she did. <laughs> Well, one thing about that era, the 1970s, you know, Jim mentioned the civil rights movement, the women's movement. There was a starting of the gay rights movement. It was a time when people were talking about equality and equal rights. And there was the question, do we have an equal right to clean air and clean water? Because during the 50s, particularly, you know, if the highways came through or if a plan had to be built, that was for the good of the whole and the individuals just had to move over. And I think there was a new question about the legality. You talked about standing. Uh, and what could be done, and that's the reason it was uh, uh, NRDC was on the model of the mm -hmm. NAACP. So let me ask you a, a, a sort of more personal question. So John, you write in the book that you left a secure professional position mm -hmm. for the idea of a job with another child on the way, and Patricia's still in school. In fact, you had to raise the money for, for your salary. Uh, what led you both to risk steady income, prestigious jobs, Southern District of New York, and basically, you know, another child on the way, kid already there, you're in school, and particularly because, I mean, a, a lot of our graduates are going to face situations in the next few years where they're given the opportunity to take risks. How did you, how did you both uh, think about this? Uh, I think blindly. Uh, we just, that, we just <coughs> made a decision that this was something we wanted to try. And I, I, I recall there were several steps along the way where we really were questioning <laughs> whether we had made the right decision, especially when the IRS tried to kill us off. But... Uh, 
I just think that we saw an opportunity. We knew that we both cared about the things that we were talking about and what we saw as what it might lead to. You know, our version of working and living in nature and being a part of the protection of nature which has sort of been paramount to my view of all of the things that we have worked on. And, uh, and then, uh, very quickly, we met this group at Yale. And that was a very interesting uh, time. Uh, Ford Foundation introduced us to four lawyers at Yale and one at Harvard. They had come as a group, and they had thought about forming something like a public interest law firm for the environment. But they couldn't get funding, and they couldn't get put a board together. So they, they, they really died on the vine. And, they, and there were three of the four clerking on the Supreme Court. Two of them were Rhodes Scholars. They were a, really a bright group of people. And without a doubt, the talent that they brought in this, when we finally agreed to work something out with them, they had actually been thinking about the issues a little bit you know, about the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. Uh, law, uh, Yale Law School had started uh, teaching a little bit there, and they had a couple of professors, one that wrote a book, The Greening of America. Uh, and uh, so it was very fortunate that I was able to latch on to this very talented group of people and bring them in and get the Ford Foundation to promise us a lot of money if we would set it up and then finally to match it up with the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and all the other statutes that were being just written as we arrived on the scene, we were able to help shape those. And we were able, more important, to really shape the rules and regulations under all those statutes so that we got to own the statutes. We and really I just want to mention the IRS fight. I won't go into the great details, but it was a very scary time, particularly for a young family, because uh, the IRS said to NRDC, uh, you know, you're tax exempt, but you can't litigate unless you come back and sort of get permission for each case you want to bring, which would have killed them right there because Ford Foundation was only going to fund an organization that could litigate. This was a somewhat new er area. So the fight went on for about six or seven months, and I must say that we really didn't know if this, w if, if NRDC would survive at all. And they had a group out in Palo Alto, uh, and one of the lawyers out there says that whenever John came back to New York or whatever, or their, their John Bryson, who was their leader, they were sure he would come back and say, sorry, guys, the experiment's over. So for the first couple of years, the IRS fight, and just getting started, was, uh, was tricky. It wasn't all, you know, right. roses, but it, 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 we survived. <laughs> no, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Well, well you know, the, the IRS fight was a very painful affair, but we learned a lot. And by the time the fight was over, we had divided up the world of, among the six lawyers that were then on the team, even though during the fight, Patricia moved out because we needed our apartment to house the team on the fight to get the <laughs> Internal Revenue Service. Uh, and we went around and we organized presidents from universities and great people who became our friend for our lifetime, who wrote letters and uh, became involved in, in uh, helping us get this tax exemption from the IRS. I mean, it was a really a wonderful tribute to good people who saw this as a real opportunity. But it almost, it almost killed us. Ford Foundation, however, uh, uh, stepped up and said, as soon as we got the uh, ruling, they would give us what turned out to be 10 years of funding, $350,000 a year, which was clearly more than a million dollars in today's money. And we were able to not only go forward, but open up a Washington office and very quickly open up uh, California. Right? Well, in, 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 in line with that, <clears throat> you mentioned you started with six lawyers. One of the things that, that NRDC made its mark as early on was a place that knew its science. What was behind the idea of bringing on full-time scientists? Because that was a novel, a novel idea. Well, we brought on full-time scientists because we couldn't handle the questions. And, uh, and we knew that it, it, the one thing that we knew that we had great legal talent and people were very impressed with that legal talent and what we needed was the ability to understand the issues that we were going to deal with in, with the same quality. And we were able to attract a couple of very good scientists right away and, uh, and an uh, economist. And that became the staff. And then we built, kept building in that model. 
and uh, slowly but surely, remember this is a trip over 40 years, and uh, money came slow. So sometimes it was one lawyer a year and one scientist a year, and then it, we got a little bit more money and we kept expanding the model. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now you also, made, you also faced a decision early on about whether to be primarily a membership organization or one founded more uh, by foundations and donations, and you pushed hard for, for membership. You know, there, there were several other public interest uh, legal organizations out there. Uh, the, the most uh, important model was the Center for Law and Social Policy. They were in Washington, and they were doing really amazing work in the late 60s on women's rights, children's rights, aging. Uh, and uh, they were the first people to look at the Alaskan pipeline fight. So I was, at that point, working on organized crime issues. And so I was spending a lot of time in the Justice Department. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I would hang out at the Center for Law and Social Policy. And so I picked up a lot of techniques from the Center for Law and Social Policy. And, uh, and I thought that uh, they would be a really a very, very good model for uh, moving forward. So I, I lost my where, where membership. Oh, the membership. membership. Yeah. I looked at them, and I realized that they were getting all of their funding from a handful of foundations, and and I said, then, you know, this doesn't look like a very stable model. Uh, if I do it, when we do it, we want to get uh, a membership. And then the second thing that happened is, one of the people that we met early on was the fundraiser for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And he had put his own money up to help support the NAAC, NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And he would do it on, by letter camp. He would get his money back by letter campaigns. And he would write about some of the atrocities that were happening uh, that the NAACP Legal Defense Fund was tackling. And he built up a very, very significant membership in that organization. So he came and he said, I'll do the same with you. I'll help you. You'll, we'll build you a membership. Uh, and uh, we didn't take his money, but we took his idea. And we were able to start uh, building a high-end membership. Uh, we've got some mailing lists of some really important people. And, and it, it, the idea caught on. And, and then we fought for a decade. Should we spend our money building a membership? Because it cost a lot of money. I remember staff meetings and board meetings. John always advocated membership, but often he was really a lone voice because it cost a lot of money to get those lists and to mail things. It was all snail mail, obviously. But, and the argument would be, wait a minute, we can take that money and hire another lawyer. So there was that tension. But I think in the long run, everyone agrees that the membership path was the right way to go. And another strategy, sort of in keeping with that, that I think has set NRDC apart, has been your work with the famous entertainers, Robert Redford, Emmylou Harris, Glenn Close, um, DiCaprio, and others. How did this come about, and, and what have been some of the risks to, to that strategy? Well, we met Robert Redford early on, and uh, you know he's a really nice guy, <coughs> uh, as Bill Shemides knows. Right, I should ask you he's a recent recipient a of recent, the League Award. Uh, uh, we met him in 1975. Uh, when we were out uh, uh, at the Four Corners, the, the building of some major power plants out there, and uh, we hooked up and worked with him a little bit on those. And then uh, he had a movie, All the President's Men, and he wanted to have a benefit in New York that would benefit his wife, his then wife, Lola, who was working on clean air issues, except she didn't have a membership and she couldn't figure out how to invite anybody to the movie benefit. NRDC by that time had maybe three or 4,000 members. And uh, we had a couple of really talented, and still have with us a couple of really talented people who were able to figure out how to bring in a real crowd. And we had a dinner, and, um, and Redford and uh, all of the people who were involved in uh, all the president's men writing it, and the actors. And um, it was a smash affair, really a smash. We raised a lot of money. And it set up a whole system of benefits for NRDC, movie benefits. And whenever Redford had a good movie, he always gave us the benefit. He then joined the board, 1975. Uh, and we had a green, the first of the green group meetings at our home in the Beaverkill, up in the Catskills, which has always been our base of operations. Uh, 
And uh, we had the 10 leaders of the principal environmental organizations up there, and Redford came. And he said to everybody, I'm here because I want to support all of you in all of your work. I'm an environmentalist, and I care about what you do. It was very nice. And he said, I'm, going to, I'm joining the NRDC board because I, I feel I owe it to the litigators to be on, the, on, their, on their board. And so that was the, the beginning of the relationship. And then the lessons learned from working with Redford is he, he did not want to have anything else to do with Hollywood. He didn't want a second board member that was a Hollywood person. Uh, he really felt very strongly about uh, the problems with Hollywood. Can I just insert, yeah. because he talked, I, mean, I kind of want to be fair to Robert Redford. He felt that celebrity and Hollywood could be very fickle, and that certain celebrities would join the team just for their own, to advance their own celebrity rather than they were committed to the cause. So he just warned John to be careful who he chose, that it would be somebody that would be committed to the issues. And, and Redford is committed to the issues. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, he's a, he's a great guy. And then uh, some of the other people came along, like Pierce Brosnan, mm. who is well known as uh, someone who cares about oceans. He and his wife have been involved. And so we were fighting on Laguna San Ignacio, the great whale birthing place uh, down in Baja, Mexico. Uh, and they were going to make it into a salt factory. Um, Mitsubishi was going to use the, all the land surrounding this great gr a gray whale uh, Lagoon, and uh, and he joined with us, and he just he made his effort a ten year effort to help us uh, stop that lagoon from being developed. And of course, we were able to. Patricia can talk about that. The president of Mexico came to visit. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if you know the background of this. We're talking about this is it's a whale, gray whale nursery where the whales come down from Alaska, and and they the the, the whales are born in this lagoon and then they go back after a certain period of time. And Mitsubishi had proposed a big salt power plant, or salt plant. But anyway, a number of, um, of celebrities did come down. And Pierce Brosnan was there. This is a little a side story with Glenn. Glenn Close was also there at the same time. And the way uh, we people came, you would go out in little boats, and the whales would come up and let you pet them, and the baby whales. And people even some could lean over and kiss the whales. It was all very exciting, and a lot of kids loved it. And Glenn Close, um, you know, you never know where the whales are going to come, right? But she sang Amazing Grace, and the whales immediately went to her boat. We thought that was sort of interesting. <laughs> but the president, President Fox, did also come down with his children and had that same experience while this was going on. And that uh, these, uh, sometimes with big environmental global battles, the human side of it is also very important. It is interesting. We learned a lot from the, the fight uh, about Laguna San Ignacio. Uh, we had over 500,000 people write to Mitsubishi. Uh, and, uh, and, and also write to the president of Mexico. And it was a campaign that went viral. It was the beginning of our, really, our use of the internet uh, and uh, using the, the politicians and also the movie actors. And we had lots of advertising. Lots of people joined in this battle, uh, Mitsubishi being one of the three or four largest co uh, companies in the world. Uh, they had many companies. We had a mortgage that we were taking out to build our green building in uh, Santa Monica. And it turned out that Mitsubishi owned the bank. So uh, as part of our responsibility, we called up the bank and said, we can't take your mortgage. And we had Alan Horn, who was the president of Warner Brothers, and he had a bank that he used at Warner Brothers. And they so immediately we were able to get another mortgage, but we actually dumped it, uh, their mortgage. Uh, the car company came to see us in New York, and we said, basically, um, uh, they said, we're not, we're not, we don't have anything to do with the salt factory. That's a Mitsubishi chemical. We said, what's your name? I mean, it's Mitsubishi. You tell them to stop building that salt uh, factory. So in any event, it was a great battle. And then after uh, the president of Mexico went to see the lagoon with his children, they abandoned it. And, but NRDC didn't abandon it. I, I like this story about NRDC because after the, the plant was stopped, NRDC didn't just leave because they knew the fishermen and people there still needed some, some livelihood. So they stayed down there and developing schools and fisheries and working with the people and continued to do so. Mm -hmm.
So, so the, the Mitsubishi story is one <clears throat> where you went toe to toe with a large corporation, and <clears throat> excuse yeah. me, <clears throat> and they blinked first. Can you talk a bit about how your your um, your strategy working with the private sector has evolved? Because you don't always you don't always clash with corporations. No, I mean, <clears throat> actually, uh, th this is a, a very interesting. I mean, I believe that the positioning of NRDC. Uh, from a growth of our membership and where I personally like to be in the environmental world is independent of the corporations. I, I feel as though we ought to represent nature, our members, and the people that are involved in protecting the environment. But that doesn't mean that that's not a, an important place for us to meet corporations. If there's a fight over some important issue, whether it's clean air or chemicals, if you need somebody who represents the corporations to have a conversation, we're the perfect people. Because the, the, the members of NRGC trust us. Environmental organizations, the, particularly the small organizations that have a hard time, trust us in negotiations. And uh, so that's been a very, very you know, valuable place for us to play in the environmental uh, world. Uh, now, we are uh, involved with the carbon cap group, and uh, Francis serves on that, and I served on the President's Council on Sustainable Development. There are lots of corporations there. We work with lots of corporations, but I think it's important for environmentalists to have, um, you know, uh, stay by their flag. Uh, one reason you build an organization is because people learn to trust your method of operation. If you continue to do things a certain way, uh, you know, it's, it's really good for business. But we, we are working with Walmart, Nike, uh, uh, a dozen other companies in China, um, hand in glove on uh, cleaning up factories and changing uh, the uses of water for the products that they're bringing back from China. Um, we work with corporations in this country all the time. Bow Water, the largest uh, paper cutter, we've entered into an agreement with them where they agreed to stop uh, cutting old growth timber and, uh, and uh, comply with FSC rules. Uh, and that's, the, that's in your neighborhood here, the Cumberland Plateau. And uh, we've been able to uh, get them to completely eliminate their clear cutting after a really uh, a very interesting fight. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in 1989, <clears throat> NRDC published a report called Intolerable Risk, yeah. <clears throat> where he identified the dangers of the pesticide al <clears throat> alar among, oh my gosh, <clears throat> <clears throat> chokes me out. <clears throat> <clears throat> the report identified the dangers of alar, among other right. pesticides. The ensuing controversy caught NRDC by surprise. In fact, the book describes it as a scary time. Mm -hmm. uh, and you talk about it as a defining moment for the history of NRDC. Could you talk a bit about what led up to it and why it was such a, uh, why it was such a critical period for the organization. I'll, I'll start with that and then John can kind of wind up with some of the more legal stuff. Uh, it started in California where Al Meyerhoff uh, and Laurie Mott, uh, who were called the dynamic duo, were first studying the effect of pesticides on workers. But that led to, well, what about the rest of us? What are we eating when we get the carrots and the you know, celery from the garden? So they literally just did market uh, basket research. Laurie went to the supermarket, bought vegetables, took it to a lab, and they tested it. And there was DDT and all kinds of things that had even been outlawed that were still on the vegetables. So this led to a larger study of vegetables all, you know, on both coasts and what could be done. And one uh, woman in New York who was just starting with NRDC and had a new a toddler, a new child, and she was reading this report, and she was, had worked on getting her doctorate in toxicology, and um, saw that all of the studies done to test what chemicals do were based on 160-pound males. And she had a 30-pound child who was drinking a lot of apple juice. You know, children eat a lot of applesauce and drink a lot of apple juice. And alar came up as one of the substances that was being used. And uh, so she realized that, uh, and, and together, it wasn't just Robin, that the children were taking, taking in a lot more pesticides per body weight than any of the tests had shown. So that's when they decided to, uh, to write this about uh, intolerable risk. And Alar kind of surfaced in all of this. And, and I'll let you pursue yeah, what happened there were, that. Well, that's the great story right there. I mean, the fact that we found the apple juice and, and the impact on children 
but the study found uh, over 20 other chemicals, uh, but just so happened that Alar went, you know, hit the, went off the chart, uh, and it was a very significant level above uh, levels that were recommended. And uh, so we went, we, we went and uh, approached the EPA and the, all of the agencies, and, uh, and then uh, 60 Minutes got the story, and we went on 60 Minutes, and then we had Meryl Streep become a spokesman, spokeswoman for this issue, and she was you know, fabulous um, on some early morning talk shows, and the next thing we knew, we had 35,000 new members and people clamoring uh, to find out what, whether their food was safe. So uh, we got sued for millions of dollars by the apple growers. Uh, it was a huge uh, uh, case. Uh, I was actually, it was one of the few times I was uh, worried about a lawsuit, but we had good lawyers out in Seattle that represented us, and uh, uh, Paul Weiss was our uh, local attorney, and uh, so we, we were pretty well represented. Uh, and then the, the case was finally dismissed. Alar was uh, pulled from the market by um, the manufacturer, and uh, two uh, studies by EPA and the FDA uh, found that uh, Alar was, uh, continued to be a risk and, and uh, recommended it being pulled for the use on food. So that, it all worked out very nice. We got a lot of new members, but we are the study in business schools of uh, how, to, how to make a big mistake in public relations. And the impact was, you know, a, a lot of people to this day say the Alar mess, you know, or the Alar. The Alar scare. Yeah, Al Alar scare. Alar. <laughs> but guess what happened? We now have organic food everywhere. It was literally recognized as the starting point of a major move towards healthy foods. And uh, so I'm, I'm very proud of the Alar case, even though I wish we had handled it um, a little bit better. Bear in mind, 1989, we were 20 years old, which is a lot. <clears throat> you can go in the army and you can drink when you're. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, we were still just adding people, building an organization. We, you know, we were out there, and uh, when you're out there, you're making mistakes and. Uh, and we, we had no communication staff. Every lawyer at NRDC, every scientist, was responsible for all of his work, including public relations. Now, we had an agreement that if there was anything that was dangerous, it had to come to my office, and we would sit and we would talk about it. And we, we had a very good system of communication. But there were a lot of times in the course of the uh, 40 years where people were really out there. And this was one, but it had a, it had a very good outcome. Mm -hmm. So your book calls the defeat of the anti-environmental writers in 1995. This was the 104th Congress, the Gingrich, uh, Gingrich led House of Representatives, the, the man famous for the contract with America. Uh, you describe it in the book as, quote, the single most important environmental victory in United States history. Uh, those are strong words. Why, why the superlative? Why was that so singly important? Well, it was, attack, it was an attack on all, the, all <clears throat> the things that we cared about. All the work that we had done for uh, 25 years was, uh, was up for grabs. And uh, you know, they were, uh, uh, Newt Gingrich was about to uh, undo the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and all of the other uh, statutes, or render them rather useless is another way of putting it. And, uh, and NRDC, for several reasons, was able to make this into a major cause, and I'll, I'll tell you why. It, when the election came and the Republicans took over the House, everybody in the environmental movement is, like today, a little shocked by the last election. And people got very, very down. And it looked like you know all the things that we had been fighting for were going to be lost. And, uh, and NRDC had just finished its first capital drive. And we had $25 million in the bank. And with that $25 million, we hired a communications team. We set up an advocacy office in Washington with a wonderful team of people, really good people, who had 
been working for congressmen who had lost their jobs, and we picked them up. And we went out on that issue after uh, the effort to cut back those environmental laws with a hammer and a tongue. And we got a lot of good people to support us, including some cartoonists who started making fun of you know, Doonesbury. Mm -hmm. Really just dug in and really went after them day after day. I, one of the uh, was a report by Ted Kennedy uh, uh, in the Senate. He said, if you vote this way, you're going to be the next person in Doonesbury. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, we, we achieved a, a great deal. And I'll tell you one very important lesson uh, is that people have a very short memory. They don't understand why it's important to have clean air and clean water and all of these things. And people start throwing in, well, it's too expensive. It's too bad. It's not expensive. The America is so lucky that we have clean air and clean water and that we have a Clean Air Act that is now going to help us fight the carbon fight. I mean, it's, you can't imagine what strength it gives us. And I know a lot of people are worried about America's environmental laws right now. And uh, you know, China's in doing this and that, and we need to, have, we, don't have a, we don't have a climate bill, and we're not, we're not uh, doing energy efficiency the way we should, and so on and so forth. But we have had 40 years of incredible laws that have protected us. And we, that's a lot to build off. And uh, so our job is to not let those laws be damaged. And we're now ready, uh, as you heard today, uh, uh, Jim was with us as uh, Wesley Warren, our program director, who's our legislative person, told him about what our plans are to, to work on protecting these laws as we're faced with the next challenge. So this is just a new decade. Uh, it's another time for another lesson in the importance of the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, and that's what we're up for. So you've been partners in raising a family. You've created and guided NRDC. You've both achieved professional success. There are a lot of students uh, in the audience who are going to have dual career families, where both spouses want their own professional achievements and a supportive family environment. Uh, you've made it work. I, I think it would be helpful maybe if you could share some of the, some of the lessons you've learned sort of as guidance because uh, a lot of folks are going to hopefully be crafting similar, similar paths. Well, I think that uh, John and I shared the same values so that we were building together uh, a, a sort of parallel. Now, I'm not a lawyer, and uh, John and I, we've been partners in this, and I've been, we've been together through this. I also was a teacher, uh, and, and I actually majored in uh, comparative literature and, and finished in New York City. And, but nevertheless, it, was, it happened conveniently to be a profession that also gave uh, me a lot of free time to do things and would uh, go with John to staff meetings and to board meetings. But I think more important than that, and we've been hearing this as we've been going and visiting various NRDC offices. NRDC now has 400 employees. It started out with you know, 10 or 12. But our philosophy has always been that we, we think of NRDC as, as, as an extension of our family. And we always, uh, we, there were people always in our home and we travel together and whether it be staff or board or donors. And that's been a part of the philosophy. And we were really, it was heartwarming just last week we went to a retreat of the NRDC staff. And uh, people were still talking about that sense of family within the organization. Well, it, uh, it helps to have a good mate, you know, if you want to do something like this. We have uh, three children that we like a lot and, and spend a lot of time <laughs> spent a lot of time with. And uh, they're, uh, all three of them are very interested in environmental issues. Uh, when, uh, when we started NRDC, uh, Patricia, I mean, when you start something and it's so small, everything you do seems so large. So you know, all the fundraising took place in our apartment. The dinner parties took place in our apartment. The board members would come. Uh, it was very casual. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and so, we got to understand a lot of people, and they understood us, and they accepted our values one way or the other. And, uh, and I think that uh, the staff of NRDC came to respond to Patricia in a particular way and respond to me in a way that I think turned out to be very beneficial for the building of NRDC. Uh, you know, also, uh, because I think it's about jobs, it's about the future, we have together created a a whole pile of little organizations that have followed us around. I mean, Patricia is one of the founders of the Land Trust for the Little Tennessee. 
OK, so if she does that, that means I have to help her raise money. <laughs> and uh, you know, and get people up in the valley of the Little Tennessee to preserve that valley, which is west of North Carolina, or Macon uh, County. But we also have been involved with the Open Space Institute. I'm the chairman of the Open Space Institute, and it's a major land acquirer. Well, that really suits our, you know, our personalities about land because I'm uh, very interested in land protection, and uh, and I, and I have advocated for people who are young, that there's a lot of environmental jobs. Uh, there, it, no matter what you do with your legal career, you can become a corporate lawyer or a, a, a government lawyer. You can also be an environmental lawyer in that work and also in your private time. People care a lot about the environment, and every single community is falling on their knees to get volunteers who really can do things. Most places just don't have the the capability of really making a difference. And that's something that we've been able to enhance in all the communities that we have lived in. And I think that, that's been very, very rewarding. And of course, that's where our friends are now. There are people who are doing the same things, who are out trying to you know, make, make the place a little better. So, uh, and then NRDC, by the way, I, I, I just have to say, I'm very proud of Duke. I think Duke is uh, really, uh, done a lot for me. It has honored me in a way that I have to tell you I'm very proud of. I'm proud that I'm representing the flag of Duke. When I'm outside of, uh, when I'm not here in Durham, and I'm not here very often, I make sure that everybody knows that I came from Duke, and I care about Duke. And, uh, and, I, and I think it's made a huge difference in the environmental world. Uh, Jim Mormon, who wasn't mentioned as one of the early pioneers, Jim Mormon and I were classmates. He was the first president of the Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund. Mm. And, uh, and I spent a lot of time with Jim, and he spent a lot of time with uh, he and his wife, with Patricia and I, on strategy and how, to, how could we help each other. And I'd find a donor, and I would send it to him. And if the donor seemed more conservative, I'd get him. You know, it, and and it, it was a huge benefit. I think, uh, I think Duke, whatever, whatever it was in the early years, and I'm sure it's now, uh, is a place that uh, tells people that they can go out and, and have a big impact if they, if they want to. I certainly feel it, 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 uh, it helped me a lot in get my, getting my first job, uh, even though I didn't like it. <laughs> I liked it, but I didn't, you know, it's not my, but the, going to the U.S. Attorney's Office and getting that litigation experience and being working with smart people who were really smarter than, than I was and taking advantage of their skills and then taking that to NRTC. It was a you know, very powerful uh, way to build a, a life and a career. Terrific. So I've got more questions. We've only got about 12 minutes left. So I'd like to open it up if there are questions uh, from any of the students here. You mentioned your passion for expanding the membership of NRDC. I was wondering if you could expand on that and in particular describe the expanding role that the membership would play, not necessarily just financially, but in terms of advocacy. OK, well, you can't ignore financially, because try 700,000 people at $30 a person, and some of them a lot more. Uh, you know, it's a, it, it pays a lot of bills. And it gives us a base that really allows us to stay in issues that not many people can stay in. There's a handful of organizations that have these kinds of financial resources. So that's one. Then the second group of uh, our e-activists, and they are actually, you know, they come to our web, they fight our battles, they, uh, they, they're constantly in touch with us about issues that, they're, that we're involved in and they want to be involved in. Uh, and we can call on that uh, group of people in amazing ways. And uh, so they, they are our political base. Now, we have built other political bases. Uh, we have a group of people we call environmental entrepreneurs. Uh, they are, uh, like Cindy Horn, uh, is, uh, you know, and other people like Cindy uh, Horn. Alan Horn is the president of Warner Brothers, and his wife is one of our environmental entrepreneurs. It was set up by a man who founded Sybase. And, uh, and he now has 1,000 businessmen and women from across the country who work on high technology and other uh, you know, interesting uh, 
the kinds of things we all hope the country will look like in the future, where they're thinking about clean works and, and blue homes and all those sorts of things. And uh, they are now not only donors to NRDC, but they are a major lobby force. They go wherever we have a battle. They are the people literally who passed uh, 1493 in California and, and uh, Assembly Bill 32, that's the Car Act and the Climate Bill in California. And the same group, different ones, did the same thing in, for Reggie in New York and uh, Maine to Maryland on the Climate Bill. And these are people with influence and money and the future and they're young and they're attractive and they, you know, they make a big, they make a big difference and they, they're people we need. So we have set up that kind of a group. We have a C4 that is also uses our, our members uh, and our e-activists and uh, if, uh, for political activity. So that's, that's basically it. <coughs> When developing the organization, looking where to litigate, especially as an organization at the beginning that had very limited funds, how did yep. you go about choosing when and where to litigate? Was it, uh, did you look at the courts in which way they were starting to lean, or did you latch on to specific issues that could uh, become popular um, and get press? What kind of concerns and considerations did you take into account when crafting a legal strategy um, going forward? Uh, well, uh, let's just talk about the first decade. The first decade was basically all about building laws, rules, and regulations. That's what we saw. I mean, quickly we realized that we had a niche that was really, really valuable. And funders saw it too. So they, would, they were supporting our efforts to really make the systems with public lands, clean air, clean water, you know, all of these issues work better, get really good rules, get really good regulations, well, of course, they would be challenged. And we would challenge back. And we were, you know, we've, we brought lawsuits if we didn't think the regulations were good. I think if you read NEPA, in the first five or 10 years of NEPA, I think every case is NRTC versus, you know, whoever it was that was the administrator at that point. Uh, and and, and uh, that became a very, very important uh, part of of uh, the, the strength of NRTC was owning those statutes, becoming somebody that we didn't need to litigate as much on those statutes. Because when we, and I heard from John Quarles, who was general counsel, I just heard about this. Uh, uh, the other day, somebody came by our house and said, I need a copy of the book. And I said, fine. He said, you know, John Quarles, and I hadn't heard of John Quarles in 35 years. He said, John Quarles used to hand me papers and say, Check this out. NRDC is usually right, but I'd like to find a way to fight them, you know, <laughs> and, and and that was the sort of the reputation we had. Uh, yeah, and NRDC, the, the the phrase was NRDC was a shadow of EPA, and the story that uh, Dick Ayers, who was monitoring clean the Clean Air Act, you know, basically to see if the rules were enforced. And uh, some of the EPA officials said, you know, you guys from NRDC are like American patriots. You're behind every tree. So it, it, as, <laughs> as we said, but the laws were new, NRDC was new. And so everybody at that point was somewhat working together. And it actually, I think the EPA even agreed that sometimes bringing lawsuits helped them enforce the law. So and then it was that kind of an agreement in the beginning. The final answer is we also took on a particular statutes like the Clean Water Act. We sent out a group of scientists to look at the permits we found out that the permits were just baloney. Nobody filled out the, honestly filled out the permits. So we started surreptitiously testing waters up and down rivers through the east and the west and the midwest. And then we brought hundreds of lawsuits against the companies for violations of the permit. Well, we brought more lawsuits on water permits than EPA and the Department of Justice combined. And, uh, and, and that changed the, the, the uh, permitting system. And we were soon able to give that up because we couldn't find any, as many violators. It, was, it wasn't worth fishing in those waters. And then we would take on, you know, now other, other ways of I looking at it. I just want to talk about uh, the BLM, the another one. When John said earlier we divided up the earth, I mean, it was kind of the way it went out in San Francisco. Johanna Wald, who was one of the first women lawyers hired, 
she, when she joined, John Bryson said, okay, what do you want, the oceans or the land? <laughs> and what are you going to take care of? And she said, I'll take the land. So she started investigating BLM lands, and she couldn't even find out who was in charge. I mean, she almost had to go to the phone book and call a local office. No environmental impact statements were being filed. I mean, it was just all behind closed doors, you know, everybody working hand in glove. So she, it started out at that level, investigating and then beginning to bring these lawsuits to force environmental in, impact statements on these vast millions of acres of, of grazed land. And we, we have a litigation team. Uh, there are litigators from every office. It's run by a lawyer named Mitch Bernard, who's a wonderful, talented lawyer, really just magnificent. And we have a litigation committee of board members that I serve on. We go over all the cases, uh, get a memo on them, and we discuss legal strategy to the extent that it's possible. And, uh, and so all the heavy lifting is done by the litigation team. When we see a big target, let's say uh, we find out that Texaco, Smithfield Hams, or Bethlehem Steel, or uh, Mallincroft, all four companies that we have sued, we expect that the litigation may go on for a decade. And that goes into that group of people, and they go, they go after it. And all of those, we, we succeeded in winning cases against them for uh, various kinds of water pollution. All right, we're going to have to get up to the thing. All right, so I guess uh, uh, one more, maybe two, quickly. Uh, I was wondering, what role do you think the Clean Air Act will have in, you know, perhaps uh, combating climate change uh, from well, I think it's going to, it's a great question. I think it's the most important weapon left. Well, there are two, two weapons. I think uh, the, the defeat of the effort to kill off the climate bill in California is very important uh, because it was such a victory uh, for climate in California, and that's the eighth largest economy. So that's a very significant victory. Uh, and the Supreme Court has found that uh, carbon is a pollutant. And uh, Obama has said that he is going to give Lisa Jackson a free hand. Uh, my view, of, I keep telling this story, uh, and I, I, at the retreat and other places, I keep saying to people, we have got to protect Lisa Jackson. We've got to make her Joan of Arc. But Joan of Arc got burned at the stake. <laughs> so, that was, so I've changed it to a polar bear. She's going to be our. Still working on the image. We need to work. Any but I guarantee you, you will see a defense of EPA and Lisa Jackson that you will not believe. You know, we NRTC will not be the only organization doing it. But she is, she's in for a very tough ride. But boy, she is so talented and so capable. I, you know, I don't know of another person in the country that I would want in that position than Lisa Jackson. So we're going to be right there with her. OK, Vanessa, last question. Um, well, I can see NRDC's footprint all around the globe. I have the pleasure to meet a couple of colleagues, NRDC colleagues, um, working in China in DC. Yes. And uh, we had to, I, I would have a fun chat. But uh, what do you think the strategy that you play out? Um, in, in China? China or, yeah. Well, in China, you know, uh, we have a now a very successful office. We, have, I, I, we may have 30 people. It's largely staffed by uh, Chinese lawyers. Uh, and, but there are uh, one Chinese-American lawyer and Barbara Fenimore. And Barbara Fenimore is uh, the wife of a career State Department official who uh, headed up the Beijing. He was the chief State Department official in Beijing. Then he became the uh, equivalent ambassador in uh, Taiwan, and now he is the uh, chief official in Hong Kong. So that's 20 years of meeting everybody in the government of China. And she has been with us working, setting up our office in China. And we have unbelievable contacts throughout the government there. And, uh, and we work with Beijing Law School. We have a clinic over in there. I've met, I've met a young, uh, a young a lawyer who runs the legal clinic in, at Beijing Law School. And uh, he has modeled his efforts after NRDC. Uh, and, uh, and we have given him a lot of resources, so that, that, uh, and, and we work with him with his students and helping him. Uh, but I think what's really turned out, we did a building code for uh, Chungking Province and uh, the Yangtze River, the area. 
And that was such a success that it was adapted uh, by the national <coughs> government. And then now we are working in the principal industrial areas with a team looking at water pollution, chemical pollution. Textiles, a, lot, a the, big program on textiles. Uh, uh, Bob Fisher from the Gap family is on the board, and he has opened up his operations to us so that we could work with uh, people there and really make some headway with uh, and, and huge changes in water pollution, just water pollution alone. Mm -hmm. And energy efficiency comes into play. So there's a great opportunity, and we have a, a great, uh, great relations in China, uh, and we try not to head into areas that will uh, you know, stop us from achieving the biggest bang that we can possibly have, which is really helping uh, on efficiency and uh, clean water. All right, well, well, thank you for sharing with us your personal history, the history of NRDC, uh, and the history of environmental law. And I think the most remarkable thing is that they're all three intertwined. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.